Hey everyone, what I'm going to go over in this video is a complimentary um, code explanation to our recent primer paper that explains how to process text data for property, the semantic property norm task. I will say that's a very specific task, but the first part of this analysis would really work well for any kind of text data that you're wanting to do some cleaning of. So we'll start by importing the data talk a little bit about cleaning up the data and spell checking, some normalization, move on to limitization, then stop word exclusion. And those sort of steps can apply to almost any text analysis. But then specifically, we'll get into the bag of words method and the multi-word sequence method for property norm kinds of data. So this matches our paper. I'm going to walk through the included R scripts in order as the paper and all of this can be found in our github and there's a readme that explains all of these in order as well as you can follow along in the paper so this is just going to give you a bit more explanation if you need more help understanding what the code is doing and um don't mind listening to my accent so here we go uh the first file is our dependencies file and this is just all of the different um um, packages that we're going to use and this does work a little bit better if you are in a project an R project but we'll make it work and I'll kind of explain along the way and hopefully we won't find any random typos because <laughs> I just did so um, I think I've cleaned it all up and let's get started so the first real file is to import the data and so at the top of all of these I have to source the dependencies or this won't run <laughs> So we're going to tell it to run those dependencies and now all of our libraries are open. Okay. For the next section, I'm going to import the um, data set and let's look at what that looks like. Okay. Now for this, what we have participants do is we give them a queue like airplane and then they are requested to tell us what they think airplane means. So what makes an airplane an airplane? So they should answer things like, it flies, um, this one here, it's big, it has a pilot, it has a cockpit, it has wings. And I would suggest in this data, and this is the way some other projects have been done, but you know, I learned this lesson later in life. Um, in this data set that you're looking at, what you see is each row is an individual participant. Right, so this is in long format, meaning that um, each queue is represented multiple lines and each participant is one line. However, within the feature response column here, what you find is that there are multiple features listed. And so I really want this to be in sort of long, long format where each queue feature is a row. Um, but hindsight, you know, you learn these things <laughs> later. And so I had just one large text box where participants type to their answer. Other, other studies have done it where it's a, like a short answer box and they have to write, you know, five different features. I would recommend that type of system, but um, this uh, code will show you how to process data that's in either format. So that's good for all, everyone, but you know, uh, research methods wise, I would tell you <laughs> to make it one line at a time. So we would have airplane fly, airplane big, airplane fast for the first participant. And then I could just have a participant code to make sure I understood how many people I had for each one. Okay. But this is what my data looks like. And the very first thing we want to do is just lowercase all of the data. Now, for some spell checkers, this might undo some of your work, but where a good spell checker will know the difference between apple, the company, and apple, the fruit. But since we're probably going to combine all of these things together, um, we're just going to lowercase everything at the front so that many of the regular expressions we're going to use and replacement functions are all assuming lowercase. So when we do that, we simply now have everything in lowercase, which doesn't look like it's changed much, but um, it has been lowercase. So once I do that, I want to move on to spell checking. Okay. Spell checking is very tricky um, and is not perfect. So what we really want to do is create a spelling dictionary. 
So our code here is going to create this dictionary that you could then hand edit if you so desired to have all of the correct spelling terms. When we originally processed this data for a paper that was recently published, we hand spell checked everything. So um, I did not tell my lab that I wrote a paper on how we should never have hand checked everything. So here we are, I'm teaching you how to do it so you don't struggle like I did. Okay. So much of this is gonna be used tidy language. Not all of it, just, you know, half. <laughs> so the first thing we're gonna do is this unnest tokens function. So unnest tokens, what it does is it's going to take an, imp a, um, an input option, which if I look here uh, on our X1, it's going to actually be feature response. We changed the name of that so it was a little clearer. And what we do is for unnest tokens, we put in the um, table or the data frame, what output we would like it to be called. Um, and then what input that should be. So it needs to be a column in the data set. And all unnest tokens does is effectively create a list of words. Okay. And that nicely has kind of kept the original column. So let's actually do the view here of the date, the original queue, and now it's just taken every single word and just separated them out. So this is a tokenizer function. Remember that tokenizing here, we're just separating words, mostly on word boundaries. Okay. Um, and then the row here indicates, you know, kind of keeps the participant information together. Okay, so 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 are all the first original row. Now I'm going to create a unique list of tokens from that. And all this is really just a, a way to keep track of just all of the possible tokens. So these are all the types, if you will. And I've, I've kind of gotten rid of the participant information because it's not important right now, but this will allow me to only spell check each word once um, or each unique token once. The library we're going to use is Hunspell for this particular one. Hunspell is a really um, popular package and you can learn a little bit more about it by doing question mark Hunspell. And this is actually what a lot of open source software works on. And um, there are other options, but this is one of the best ones for R. So we're going to take that word list and just figure out the spelling errors. So let's look at spelling errors. Okay. It's a list. It's a list of a list, a mostly empty list because there are no errors, but here's one. Let's click on that. Okay. And the option is flies. Well, flies is incorrectly spelled. Okay. And then lots more. Here's transportation, also incorrectly spelled. So we're, it's finding all the words that I, it doesn't know what they are. Attendance, turbulent, okay. um, airplane with, with the letter switched. So this is exactly what it looks like. It's a, a list of all spelling errors. So we unlisted that and just took the unique ones because sometimes people make the same spelling error. So this is allowing us to only check each one once. Okay. So the first thing you do is you find all the spelling errors. The next line is hunt spell suggest. This is a suggest what word should be correct. So looking at our, our list of unique spelling errors, in the dictionary here, I'm going to do American English. There are other dictionaries, though. It's one reason why we suggest this package is that there are different options, even with um, regional forms. So um, there's uh, um, British English in here as well. This takes a moment because it, um, depending on how many spelling errors you have, it will take a while to run through all the different suggestions. quite a while. <laughs> so um, the next line of code when we wait on that to run actually unlists and picks the first one. There we go. So let's look at spelling suggest now. Okay. So this is also a list and for each of our spelling errors, all 2,000 of them, it will give us a, a list of the most 
probable to least probable spelling suggestion. So for flies, it actually suggests that we just go straight back to fly. For me, that's okay because we're going to actually do that procedure later. For transportation, we get the first one is the, the one we probably wanted. For airplane, for gray, now it does auto capitalize sometimes, so we might have to decapitalize off and on. Um, here from Mississippi. Okay, so it's going to try to autocorrect these back into uppercase. With the warning that some of these are very strange. Okay, so the first one is often the best one because they're in decreasing order of probability. However, that does not mean that you should not look. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do, assuming the first one is the best one, is unlist this bad boy and pick the first one. Okay. So essentially that just takes this spelling suggestion from this kind of complex list to a single um, vectorized column of the most probable answers. Okay, so let's look at it now. And now these are the most likely answers. And we're going to create a dictionary here. So we're going to put together the error and the suggestion into this spelling dictionary. And the nice thing about this is now I can go back and go, oh no, flies should have been spelled differently. Um, there are some other very funny ones. We could de decapitalize here. Um, it does recognize some proper names like McDonald's. Here's yellow, which was the example in our paper, but then there are also other ones that are very strange. And so you would want to make sure that um, they are correct. So here for um, buried, that's not bird, it's just buried, misspelled, okay. Vegetable, <laughs> it's veritable. So there are definitely a taste here, should not be tacit. So I would tell you to take this spelling dictionary and we have, um, we have it right out here as a specific file. And then I would go through and edit that file to your liking, re-import it, and then continue on. Okay. And so the other thing we've added here is the spelling pattern. And all that um, does is it adds some a little bit of code here to make the replacement easier. So this looks for a word boundary around this incorrect word so that it doesn't replace flies in the middle of another word. So this just allows us to make sure we're replacing that token only and not um, partial tokens. Okay. So then we wrote that bad boy out to a file so that you could edit it yourself and then import it back in for any changes or corrections that you see. So I've already seen several, so I'd want to edit those. Now, well, let's fix it. Okay. So we can use our unnest tokens. Okay, an input here is feature, uh, feature response. All right, so what I want to do is import um, for unnest tokens is the same basic idea. So I have an output column called token, the input is called feature response. Um, the tokens are split on different strings and we keep these patterns. So what this thing does, let's go back and look at that. Whoops, caps lock. Is this helped deal with the fact that participants um, wrote multiple answers. So if I view X, right, you fly in it, it's big. You can see that there's some extra spaces here. Um, and then embedded a little bit too are some tabs and some enter keys uh, where participants were um, typing multiple answers on multiple lines. And we actually just unloaded that. Okay, and I could use my rows here as a participant ID if I needed to. But this code is not necessary for spell checking, but was necessary to deal with the fact that I had multiple features 
embedded into a single participant's answer where I really wanted the data to be participant one, Q1, feature one, participant one, Q1, feature two, etc. Okay, so this helped me unload that uh, and split it into separate lines. So what we wanted to do to tokenize that was to split string split on this particular pattern. Okay, and that pattern is a bunch of spaces, commas, periods, and semicolons. Okay. Now I want to take out all of the white space and other noise. So we're going to get rid of tabs, we're going to get rid of uh, enter keys, returns, and sort of squeeze out all the extra spaces now that we've um, split them into multiple lines. Okay. And this is not a spell check again issue, but it's more of a just practical text processing issue. So we do end up with some empty ones, but we'll get rid of those later. All right, now let's get rid of them. So here we're just gonna take out any empty spaces. Okay, these aren't NAs, they're just sort of blank, um, blank lines. Okay. And so that got rid of that one airplane one that was blank. Now here's the magic spelling replacement. So um, this is in the string R, or what was it, string R, string I? It's been a while since I've written this code. This is in string I library, where it's replace all based on regular expressions. Um, the, oh, we want to replace the tokens in our tokens column. Um, these are where the spelling errors are now saved. We want to find the spelling pattern. So let's view that one more time. Okay, our spelling pattern here. Let's just make sure that we find those word boundaries because we've squeezed out all, all the bad spaces. Uh, we want to replace them with that spelling suggestion. Okay, so find this, replace it with that. Okay, and don't vectorize them. It just keeps them together. It just kind of does um, um, a general substitution or a G sub. Okay. This also is a little bit slow because we're searching thousands of lines now for any instance of these spelling errors and their corrections. Right, so let's look at tokens now. Okay. So we've got Q, token, and their corrected word. Excellent. Or the corrected column, rather. So you fly in it, it's big, it's fast, they're expensive. Okay. And what we want to do is just sort of like clean that data set up, get rid of the things we don't need. So we want to rename um, these columns. This may have been one of those things that I didn't fix. So Q, we want to leave. Token, we want to consider, we want to get rid of. We want to change corrected to feature. So leave Q alone. Feature becomes corrected, or corrected becomes feature. Sorry, the rename function. Um, and only pick Q and feature. There we go. So now we're left with Q and the corrected one. Okay. So it fly instead of it flies. And then we'd write that out. All right. That just allows you to keep track of what um, suggestions you made. Moving on, um, he, at this point on, on, it does assume that you are writing the data out and then reading it in. And this allows you to make some mangle edits in the middle if you need to. So I would actually read in our spell checked features, which is the data set we just wrote out. And so this is our corrected one. See, it fly instead of it flies. All right. With our new data set, we're going to unnest tokens again. So we're going to kind of do the um, this kind of tokenization and then merging back together a couple of times for practical reasons. Okay. 
So let's look at what tokens looks like now. And so I just broke all of those down again into Q and their individual words. So we're not calling it feature because it's not a combination of words, but these are all the words from those features. And we're creating a list of unique cues. Okay, so this just allows us to do some looping action. And then we want to create a blank, a blank spot here. So this is going to allow us to use the tree tag function. And I just need a data frame to stick my answers in. Okay, so we're going to tag all of our tokens. So using limitization, we're going to first do part of speech tagging and then pick the correct lemma. So remember that limitization is where you kind of go back to the root word, whereas stimming is more of a regular expression procedure where you're just chopping off like ing or ion. And in this sort of analysis, I think limitization is a bit better because it doesn't correct to words that don't exist. So in a stimming scenario, the word wings for airplanes gets corrected to the letter W because it first eliminates the S for plurals and the ing for um, verb, um, present participle, yes, uh, whatever, the ing, right? And so you end up with the letter w, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So limitization realizes like wings is a word <laughs> and it should just be wing because wings just means plural. Okay. Again, this is not perfect. So we do have the option to write this stuff out so that you can um, edit it yourself. Okay. Now, tree tagger. Tree tagger was a difficult thing, <laughs> but it's, um, is the one that works best for R. So I don't, I wish I could tell you, I remember what I did to set up tree tagger, but I fought with it for a while. So uh, the best suggestion I have is to Google install tree tagger and uh, download tree tagger and look at their instructions. Okay. Um, and they have it for all the different like operating systems. I feel like Windows probably work the best. I'm on a Mac, um, so feel free to send me a ping and I will try to help you <laughs> with Tree Tagger because it definitely, once you get it set up, you don't have to mess with it. But um, the main thing you wanna do here for yourself is down here in this path option, that's where where you find the tree tagger folder. So wherever you installed it. So for me, that's just in this particular folder. That's the hardest part. Um, so if I search for tree tagger, I found that folder. I right clicked on it. I went to properties, get info. Too much Windows, right? And I know that it's in the base folder. So for a Mac person, that would be tilde slash tree tagger. For Windows machine, um, be sure you change the forward slashes, the backslashes into forward slashes to make this work properly. So this is the part that you gotta figure out okay. and getting it installed. <laughs> All right, so what's this, what's this loop doing? Well, what it does is it loops over each of the individual words I told it to suppress all the different messages. Um, you can leave them on until you kind of figure out what, what they are telling you. And the first thing it does is it finds, it takes the list of all of the words that go with that cue only. So in our tokens here, it's gonna pick out all of the words for airplane. Okay. And then it adds a little null at the end. This is just so it gives you part of speech for the last word. And this was just a practical issue that I was running into when I programmed this, that the um, it would never give me the part of speech for the final word. So I just added a null at the end, so it would give me the part of speech for the last word. It's going to tag those with parts of speech. The part of speech matters because that is what helps us determine what the lemma should be. We don't really want to tokenize, it's already tokenized. Um, this is an English document ID is just which queue you're on. Okay. And then this is where the path is. Okay. Once you build one of these um, data little data frames to get back the information you want, you end up 
doing a, a bit of mutating where you say, you know what, give me um, the TT results, tree tagger results, and make them characters so I can work with them. Then stick together all of the rows and give me the information about which queue it is. Remember, document ID is which queue it is. What was the token? What's the part of speech here for class, word class, and what's the lemma? Okay. So it's kind of a lot of code, but essentially is taking each cue, pulling out all the words, part of speech tagging them, and then coming up with the lemma based on the part of speech. And this is also a little slow. Okay, we've done these first two. We ran this blank data frame. Let's let this bad boy run for a minute. And then we'll look at our output from that. While it's running, I'll explain the next little pieces too. Um, the rest of this is just clean up, so it's in a format that's more useful. So we're gonna take our token tags and just rename the columns so they're a little bit more understandable, so that you realize that document ID means Q, token equals feature, part of speech, word class um, becomes part of speech. Then just clean up some of these. So if it lists it as unknown, if the, it lists the lemma as unknown, then we just over um, overwrote that. Okay. If it lists the lemma as cardinal for number, we also kind of overwrote that. And then we lowercase everything again to come back to lowercase text. I wrote that out. And so a little bit more specifically here, if the lemma was list, uh, listed as unknown, we then overwrote it with the original feature is what's happening. So if it says it's unknown, just go back to whatever it was before then. And obviously there may or may not be a better way to do some of this without this loop, but this was kind of the best um, we came up with because it couldn't come up with a good way to apply this. <laughs> there we go. Not terrible. So let's look at it. got the original document ID, the token you fly in it was their answer, right? So it gave um, its word class as a pronoun and the lemma is you. Okay. Sometimes the lemma comes up as unknown or a random S here. Um, and so when we overwrite this, we're just going to make this an S again. So essentially we're creating a feature lemma replacement system, just like our spelling dictionary. So instead of a spelling dictionary, this is a lemma dictionary. But you could then edit yourself as well. So I'm going to replace, oh, I gotta um, restructure the data. Sorry about that. And then I'm just gonna replace and lowercase everything so that now we don't see any unknowns. They are, the names make a little more sense. This is the cue, the feature, the original part of speech and the lemma that we should replace with. Some of these. Perfect. And then we wrote that out. So these are our features limitized. This is essentially a dictionary. Just like a spelling dictionary, we now have a lemma dictionary, which you could edit yourself. Then we would come over here and we'd read that lemma dictionary in. So let's view it real quick. It's the same data set, just proof. I'm going to take out all of the dashes and a, a couple of weird symbols. So this part here is just sort of going to be dependent on your data frame and what kind of weird things are left. And so if you have weird symbols um, 
or uh, ASCII, because that didn't translate correctly, you might try some of the ICONV function, which allows you to convert the encoding. Um, here, we didn't have too much going on because this data is a little bit cleaner. We had removed all, a bunch of punctuation before, but we were left with these sort of dashes and um, some of these like we are character encoding, so we just took them out. Um, and so here, this just, just really depends on what um, is left in your data, data you want to get rid of. The next step, or what this step really is about, is a stop word removal. So remember, stop words are things like the, and, a, of, but. So um, the function words, some suggestions to leave them in. You could skip this step. Um, we included it because many folks eliminate stop words. So what we're going to do here is um, take out, so filter out any remaining punctuation. Here what we did was actually replace a dash with a space so that um, these got treated as separate tokens rather than one weird misspelled token. Um, so filter out any punctuation, so a lot of this is regular expressions. Filter out any lemmas that are in the stop words list. Okay. And this library, stop words library, has just a list going. So you could add your own words here. So let's print those out. So specifically, the snowball list is 175 options, including some contractions um, that are most function words. But here, if you wanted to create your own list, you would just say any lemma in my stock word list and also filter out any NAs or um, yes, any not NAs. Okay. So let's look at our X no stop list. And so now we've gotten rid of um, all of the stop words out of the list. So before we had things like you fly in it, it's big. Now we have fly, big, fast. Okay, so that's just one way, quick way to remove all stop words. All right, so the final step would be figuring out what you want to do with that set of data. Okay. So um, I would read in for multi-word sequences here, I would read in that no stop words data, or I could back up to a step which was only limitized data, but keep the stop words. This kind of depends on what your goal is. And here we would combine them and their parts of speech. So this is kind of a best guess assumption here on what one might want to do with a multi-word sequence. So what the mutate function here um, with the lead function allows me to do is sort of paste together every two and three word combinations. So I feel like it's a little more obvious once you view what's happening to X here. So we went from just these first four columns and we added these four. So it pastes the one right after it. So maybe the participant wrote fly big, okay, fly big fast. And this sort of thing is only necessary if you want to do the multi-word sequences and you did not plan ahead <laughs> at having participants write one line per, per thing. So in our particular example, um, we had just lots of, rant, lots of answers all kind of smushed together. So this would be us kind of recombining them together and thinking about what sequence of multi-sequence we want. So I've combined them together. What am I do with that? Well, I'm gonna look for patterns of parts of speech. So this is where tree tagger comes in. So I'm gonna look for an adverb and an adjective or a verb and a noun or a verb adjective and a noun. And you could define these yourself. These were just the most common options based on previous work using multi-word sequences like the McCray et al. Okay, so let's look 
at x again, so it's going to look for these specific patterns. And if those patterns exist, it's going to collapse the rows together. So anytime it sees an adverb and an adjective together, okay, adverb, adjective, here we go, it's essentially going to just take those rows as two rows and make it one because we've now collapsed fast and expensive together. And so you won't see expensive airport. And so all this code just kind of says it finds the ones that have those sequences and removes their um, duplicates. So what I'm left with now is only the um, two or three word sequences I'm interested in. Okay. And so here is the combined lemma combination that I would be interested in. And so these would be single ones, but fly lot would be um, one of our combinations. Get high wing. <laughs> some of them are very funny. Um, use gas. So some of them make sense and some of them are, are, are silly. Um, so you'd have to decide for yourself how well you think this procedure works. All right, so create our Q lemma frequencies. So for multi-word sequences. What we're gonna do is find all of the um, not NA ones, group them by Q and count them up. And this will just give us a combination of, um, for all of our Qs, abstract being the first one alphabetical, um, here are the combos that we found. So also occurs on here, I'd probably want to filter that one out for stop words. Um, art is a big one. Um, derive, non-material, describe something. So some of these sequences make sense and some of them don't. Okay. Um, but it does create sequences that are reasonable, like, um, Fingers have fingernails was our example from before. And we'd write that out and do whatever you're going to do with it. If you're going to count it up, if you're going to use it for an analysis, etc. Now, what's the simpler solution? To collect the data in such a way that each feature is as one row and you could just simply remove stop words and total them up. Right? You wouldn't need to recombine them. So this step is only really occurring because we didn't have a good feel for um, where their answers were. And, you know, we, we did split them apart, but we, you know, we might have split them just because the tab happened to be in the data, that sort of thing. Um, if I had one participant per row, I could just replace all my lemmas, just like I did with my spell checker and move on with my multi-word frequency analysis. Okay. The other approach that you can take, which is the bag of words approach, is, is definitely easier is to read in your limitized data set and simply group it and count it okay. which is what you could do if you ran the multi-word sequence piece appropriately okay. so let's view i don't know appropriately better <laughs> our bag of words accounts we got the q the lemma and then the n okay. Now this does lose something in the ontology, the descriptors of what's happening, but um, processing wise, it is a bit faster and easier. Now you can write that out. All right. So my main suggestion here is to take what we have and manipulate it and work, work it for your data. So this is a, a processing flow specific for um, property norm data with the caveat that uh, better data collection would, would ease some of the processing here and you could get um, for the multi-word sequences you could get maybe a bit cleaner of an analysis but here's how you might hack something together for multi-word sequences if you don't have the best data or you simply have a very long text strings um, 
And so this analysis will allow you to, to clean data and to also really uh, create reproducible steps for processing the data because um, as we move to these large giant data collections, it's going to be important to really understand how that data was processed. So having this sort of workflow, even if things are, you know, you edit your spelling dictionary manually, you can say, well, we created the first spelling dictionary with Hanspell and then we edited it ourselves because it's not perfect. So this will really allow us to keep track of how these data are being manipulated across steps. So this is sort of my companion explanation for all the steps in our pro processing primer project. Too many P's together. And if you have questions or help, need help with the setup or how to manipulate it, please leave them in the comments below. And thanks for listening.